Feel the power. Welcome to Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. And to God be all the glory. It's been glorious, glorious 60 days of glory 2020. And I'm excited that this is 60 days of glory extended. Abel Damina is my name. There is a mandate of God on my life to reintroduce Jesus to this generation, equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. It is with that mandate that we are bringing all of these messages to you on the various platforms all over the world, especially right here on social media. I want to welcome every one of your friends and family and everybody that has been a consistent part of this ministry right here on social media. You must tell people about it. Do me the favor you've always done as a partaker, a co-laborer with me in the advancement of God's kingdom and bringing light through the gospel into the hearts of men by sharing the videos right now. You know, as many groups are as on your Facebook page, share it to those groups, create watch parties, Let's flood the entire Blue Marble planet with the fragrance of Jesus' grace. You never can tell who is praying sincerely for the truth of the gospel that you're sharing will connect that person with these truths that are revealed right here on the platform. Let me also use the opportunity to mention that if you're following and you don't belong to any local church where Christ is revealed, you want to be a part of a local family. The word of God says, God says the solitary in families. God wants you to be in a local church where you are accountable, where you are being taught, and where you also are able to serve the body of Christ with your giftings and callings and be a blessing to the body. And if there's no such a body in your area or community or in your nation, all you need to do today is shoot a mail to me, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. And we will try to make sure that we connect you with brethren in your area who are part of our church campus in that location so you can get the word of God, be fed the word of God, and grow in the knowledge of Christ. Let me also mention, those of you who would like to get copies of my new books, they are books you don't want to miss having. One of them is The Last Days. is a book on eschatology that deals with all the myths on 666, Antichrist, you know, great tribulation and all that around the last days. The son of perdition, false prophets, false teachers is a whole eschatology material with sound exegesis. The last days. All right. There's another one I released on the office of the pastor is a material that equips you to become an effective tool in the hand of Christ for building disciples and building believers in the knowledge of Christ and effectively serving as a pastor over a local church. You know, once you start overseeing two, three, four, five people, that's already a church where two or three are gathered. That's what makes a church. So once you're already growing to where you're beginning to disciple people, you need to read this book on the office of the pastor so you can serve the people of God no matter how many they are effectively. That book is a good book. The third one I release is the Bible truth about material world. There's usually a clash between material world and the gospel. So this is sound exegesis on what Christ taught, the apostles taught, the New Testament theology where material world is concerned and how to use material world, you know, in serving Christ and honoring Christ. Then there's the material I also released is a free material and that book is on eternal salvation in Christ. It deals with all the scriptures that throw doubts on salvation being eternal or salvation being forever. All those scriptures in the Bible, including the famous Hebrews chapter 6 verse 4, sound exegesis. But the exciting thing is that this particular book is free. We're giving it free, both in hard copy from our office and online. We have an online edition. Lastly, I want to mention that every day we're going to have the 60 days of glory extended twice a day. 12 noon GMT plus one and 10 p.m. GMT plus one. And it's going to run for one hour, 30 minutes per episode, both at 12 noon and 10 p.m. Because it's going to be a teaching session and then question and answer session with the intercontinental Mr. Michael Bush. We're going to have a blast the whole month of September as we go through the 60 days of glory extended. Let me also mention that in October, we're going to bring back to you Riot and the Counselor. 
the counselor is a program that will be announced towards the end of september so you can prepare yourself to be a part of it tell everybody about this extended version of the 60 days of glory i'm looking forward to being a blessing to you today as we serve you the grace of god fasting your seatbelt as i take you on a gospel adventure into the service where the spirit of our god is already moving happy viewing we're examining the legal and the vital work of salvation the legal and the vital work of salvation Hebrews chapter 2 verse number 1 and therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard lest at any time we should let them sleep for if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward how shall we escape if we neglect if we neglect that is key if we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Glory to God. We are examining very critically and doctrinally the subject of salvation from the redemptive point of view. We are looking at the price that was paid where it was paid how the price was paid what the price paid was and when the price was paid hebrews chapter 2 verse 5 now let's proceed chapter 2 verse number 5 for unto the angels had he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak verse 6 but one in a certain place testified saying what is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou visitest him. The writer of Hebrews was quoting this from Psalms chapter 8 verse 4 to 6. What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him. Verse 5. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. And hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Now. I'd like you to realize that we have seen that the bible is christocentric in nature the bible is christocentric in nature so now i will take you to another plane and i mean another plane in the scriptures as we continue our short study the same hebrews chapter 2 verse number 7 thou madest him a little lower than the angels thou crownest him with glory and honor and thou didst set him over the works of thy hands verse 8 now Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. We do not see all things put on the man. Now notice the statements. You made Jesus a little lower than the angels. That involves straight up that jesus put on a physical body the mortality of jesus made him a little lower than the angels so that physical formation is what the scriptures mean by made him a little lower than the angels so the discussion was what is man if you are not you know born again or if you're an ordinary man then the first thing you will be thinking about is when he says what is man you will think maybe David was wondering what happened to man. But that's not what the scripture is making reference to. Because the writer of Hebrews who now has a revelation says, We see not yet all things put under him. We do not see all things yet put under him. And that is in case you were looking at man who don't yet see all things put under him. Then he now says, but we see Jesus in verse 9. But we see Jesus. That is the Holy Ghost showing you Jesus in the scriptures. Verse 9 of Hebrews chapter 2. But we see Jesus. We do not yet see everything put on the man, but we see Jesus. I love that. So our focus and our message is Jesus. So that scripture is not showing you man before the fall or man after the fall. That scripture was talking about Jesus. We see Jesus, meaning is a Christocentric scripture. And why was he made lower than the angels? For the suffering of death. 
for the suffering of death. That means he will need to be a human being for him to be able to suffer and die for the suffering of death. So Jesus, the man, was made a little lower than the angels and he has been crowned with glory and honor. Look at that verse 9 again. I like to read the whole of that verse 9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should test death for every man. So him being a little lower than the angels was an act of grace. That he by the grace of God should test death for every man. It was an act of grace. Now look at verse 10 and 11. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. In bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Next verse. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Jesus is not in that scripture because of us. We are in that scripture because of Jesus. So that scripture identifies with us because of Jesus. It identifies with us because of Jesus. It's not like because we are the ones and we can't fulfill it, then Jesus came to take our place. No, that's not what he's saying. For this cause, he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Talking about our physical composition our physical makeup look at that hebrews chapter 2 verse 11 12 and 13 for both he that sanctify it and they who are sanctified are all of one for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren next verse saying i will declare their name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will i sing praise unto thee 13 and again i will put my trust in him and again behold I and the children which God hath given me. Now please pay attention. So Jesus is the one spoken of here. And you will see that confirmed in the book of Psalm 22. Give me verse 14 and 15 of Hebrews chapter 2. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. Remember he's not ashamed to call us brethren. So as much then as we partook of flesh and blood. He also likewise took part of the same. He also himself likewise took part of the same. That through death. He might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. 15. And deliver them who through fear of death. Were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So you can see that scripture was speaking about Jesus. Today that scripture speaks about us because we are in Christ. So invariably, we begin to see that there's an involvement of the devil there. The first thing he says about the devil there is, He that had, H-A-D, he that had the power of death, that is the devil. Now that already shows you that somebody already had the power of death. The power of death there means the power of spiritual death. The power of spiritual death. So we read what the power of death is in Romans chapter 5 verse 12. What the power of death is. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that. All have sinned. So the devil had the power of spiritual death. So the reign, the reign or the rule or the regime of Satan was the reign of sin in spiritual death. The reign of Satan was the reign of sin in spiritual death. Two things spiritual death did to humanity. Number one, you know that in spiritual death, you are dead spiritually. And a man that is dead spiritually is unaware of what is going on spiritually. A man that is dead spiritually is unaware of what is going on spiritually. Man was acting in a way he could not explain. After the fall, when he was in fellowship with God, he understood things. 
But when he fell away from God, he doesn't understand anymore. So the power of death is sin. When sin came, sin brought death. He that had the power of death, that is the devil. So now Satan comes into the picture. He that had the power of death, that is the devil. So Satan comes into the picture. And the moment he comes in, you begin to wonder, Romans chapter 5 verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Even over them that are not seen after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. The figure of him that was to come. So there was a rule of death from Adam to Moses. Death reigned in the spirit of man. Death reigned in the spirit of man. So when we see things that happen and we are tempted to be, you know, tempted, remember it is the reign of death. And when we want to see the acts of God, when we want to see the acts of God in the Old Testament, when we want to see the act of God in Genesis to Malachi, we read Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is a chronicle of the acts of God. God in the Old Testament will speak. Man will mix it and you know he will mix it with faith and that man becomes saved in a promise. To see the acts of God in the Old Testament we look at Hebrews chapter 11 because that explains to us the acts of God. Because Hebrews 11 is a chronicle of those who walked with God by faith in the Old Testament. By faith Abel, by faith Noah, by faith Enoch, by faith Abraham, by faith Sarah, by faith Moses. All of them walked by faith. So many things are acts of spiritual death in the Old Testament. Many things are acts of spiritual death. In the Old Testament. Please pay attention. So God's communication with man was in that way. God's communication with man was in that way because he was communicating with a man that was spiritually dead. So in the Old Testament therefore you will see that coloration in the communication. He said Jesus defeated sin by death. Listen carefully. He defeated Satan by death and delivered them who all through their lifetime were subject to bondage because of the fear of death. So to humanity, death was bondage. To humanity, death was bondage. To Jesus, death was a choice. To humanity, death was bondage. To Jesus, death was a choice because he sacrificed for us. He sacrificed for us. So therefore, to us, bondage to Jesus' choice. So Jesus died and defeated the devil. Jesus died and defeated the devil. Look at Colossians chapter 2 verse 11 to 15. In whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. In putting up the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism. Wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. Who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Hath he quickened together with him. Having forgiven you all trespasses. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Glory to God. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Just a little about Satan. Please pay attention. In this instance, you will agree that Jesus spoiled principalities. On the cross he spoiled principalities by his cross as we're going to see the word nailing it to his cross was not in the original nailing it to his cross is not in the original in that colossians the proper translation is that he took it out of the way 
He took it out of the way. How? Having spoiled principalities and powers. He took it out of the way. Not nailing it to the cross. He took it out of the way. That's the way it is in the original. And made a show of them openly. Where did he take away the handwriting? When he triumphed. When he triumphed. When he rose. Did he triumph on the cross? No. His triumph was not on the cross. Because we have seen so far, the place was a place of crucifixion. A place on the cross where he was made a cause. He was made sin. Now let us see another identification of the cross. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 13 to 18. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so make him peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity between the Jew and the Gentile thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar, the Gentile, and to you that were nigh, the Jew. Alright? For through him, we both, Jew and Gentile, have access by one spirit unto the Father. We both have one access by the spirit unto the Father. Talking about Jews and Gentiles. So, on the cross, Jesus united the Jew and the Gentile. We have seen that the cross to the Jew and to the Gentile, what it means. Now, in him, in Jesus, the Jew and the Gentile is represented. In Jesus, we have the Jew and the Gentile. The cause of the Jews and the punishment of the Gentiles. So in Galatians 3.13, he says Jesus was made a cause. The question now will be, what happened to the cross? He identified on the cross with us spiritually. So the cross was a symbol of identification. He identified with us. He identified also with us physically when he incarnated. When God became a man and put on flesh it was identification with us physically then on the cross he identified with us spiritually now please pay attention so he now went ahead to identify with us on the cross on that cross he became a spiritual stigma both to the jews and to the gentiles so the cross was for identification we are going to see now where victory over satan happened where did the victory look it's important you follow what i'm teaching now so that you don't become you know part of those people that when a statement is made they just start fighting without thinking the reason for some of the details painstaking details we give in teaching you may not see the importance until we have finished and everything comes together then tomorrow they ask you a question from one of those segments then you begin to value why we take time to painstakingly make sure no detail is left out in teaching. We pay attention to every detail because you are being equipped so that you too can be a blessing. So what we are dealing with now is where victory over Satan happened. Victory over Satan did not happen on the cross. Notice that when Jesus told the disciples, he said, in a little while you see me, and in a little while you see me no more, just like a woman who is in travel still has joy. He was referring to the three days. I'll be gone for three days and I'll, I'll rise from the dead. He then told them again, number one, on the cross, he was made sin. Number two, on the cross, he was made a cause of the law. Number three, on the cross, is a place where he identified with man. There was no victory on the cross. That was the beginning of the redemptive walk. The cross was the introduction to the redemptive walk. Look at Matthew 27 verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, 51. And behold, 
the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom and the earth did quake and the rocks rent next verse and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose arose next verse and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many and this was after the third day so there were two events there were two events split into three days we have seen what happened on the cross where did jesus triumph over satan that's what we're examining it was not on the cross because on the cross he identified with our state so let's talk some more about satan and jesus let's talk some more about satan and jesus hebrews 2 14 satan had the power of death satan had please take note of the tenses satan had the power of death romans chapter 5 verse 12 death reigned death reigned from adam to moses because of sin so in the old testament the most unknown personality is satan in the old testament the most unknown personality is satan that shows you that man was really spiritually dead that shows you that man was really spiritually dead such that man couldn't even factor satan out in the entire old testament if it is in the epistle you can see the works of the devil from the epistles highlighted if you take it on its own you will never know what the devil is if you just take the old testament on its own you will need the help of the epistles to unveil the devil in the old testament because that was communicated to men who were in bondage the old testament was a communication with men who were in bondage no wonder the communication was the way it was because those men were in bondage and one of the things they did not know is that they did not know anything about the devil that's why the bible says if the princes of this world had known they wouldn't have crucified the lord of glory because of their spiritual state isaiah listen carefully let me tell you something shock you a bit do you know that if isaiah and elijah were physically on earth when jesus walked the face of the earth they will have either teamed up with the rest of the jews to stone jesus they will have been among those who stoned jesus or they will have simply walked away and left him because they too were spiritually dead there was no difference between Elijah and the disciples who ran away. They said, Peter, were you not with him? I know him not. There was no difference between them and those people. They were all in the same state. So if Elijah was around and maybe uh, uh, Isaiah and all those prophets, they also would have been among people shouting, crucify him or they would have abandoned him and walked away. Even though they were the ones who prophesied. Why? Because they too were in spiritual, spiritual death. And they were spiritually ignorant. They prophesied. Yes, they prophesied. But the Bible said they didn't know what they were saying. They were prophesying, but didn't fathom what they were saying. Why? Because they were men who were ignorant. They were without the indwelling of the Spirit of God. And a man without the indwelling of the Spirit of God is a dead man. So death reigned from Adam to Moses. Please pay attention. There's no way you and I could have believed that Jesus will die, buried, and rise the third day, even if we were there ourselves. We wouldn't have believed it. I mean, it's like a man just shows up. You saw where he was born. <laughs> you know where he grew up. You, you know everything about his family. Then he comes and says, I will die. I will be buried. After three days, I will rise. You tell him, get out. You tell him, get out. Jesus, Jesus was not, you know, he wasn't special. He was born in a manger, grew up, walked the streets of Nazareth, slept, ate, was tired, cried. You know, his mother even scolded him. Where have you been? You punished me and your father. We've been busy looking for you. They scolded him. That was not it. In fact, the Bible speaking of him even said, even to the point of the cross, there was no beauty in him to desire. 
Meaning he was not even an attractive person. There was no beauty. He was like everybody else. Walked in the carpentry workshop with his father. Daddy. Then you can imagine such a person walk to you and say, I will die. I will be buried on the third day I will rise. You tell him, get out. You tell him, get out. You know, the only way they would have known was if they had understood the scriptures. But they didn't know the scriptures. They prophesied, but they didn't know what they were prophesying. Because they were spiritually dead. And that faith could have only been communicated by God. Look at 1 Corinthians 2 9, so you see what I'm saying here. But as it is written, I had not seen, talking about the Old Testament people, their eye had not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those whom he loves. Their eyes never saw. They prophesied but didn't know what they were saying. Look at the next verse. But God hath revealed them unto us, not unto them. He has revealed them unto us by his spirit. By his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things. Yea, the deep things of God. And if you look at verse 8, verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 2, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Brother Paul says in Colossians chapter 1 verse 25, pay attention. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Next verse. Even the mystery which had been hid from ages and from generation. This mystery, Elijah didn't know it. This mystery, Isaiah didn't know it. This mystery, all of them didn't know it. It's been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. This is the same mystery brother Paul was talking about in Ephesians chapter 3 verse number 2. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you word. Next verse. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So he revealed them to us. It's a mysterion, a mystery, a mysterion, the Greek. A mystery is not something hidden from your eyes to see. A mystery simply means classified information. Classified information. That means it will take something to see it. It will take something to see it. And there's only one way to declassify it, the spirit of God. There is only one way to declassify this classified information, the spirit of God. But we have now, we have now by the spirit known what they didn't know. Look at 1 Corinthians 2.14. Please pay attention. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. Because they are spiritually discerned. That is why you must understand that the prophets of the Old Testament didn't understand at all. They prophesied but didn't know what they were saying. Look at First Peter chapter 1 verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets, did you see that? The prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied. They are the ones who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you next verse. Such in what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that shall follow. Watch the next verse now. Verse 12. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things. Not unto them but unto us. They prophesied but didn't know what they were prophesying. And it was not revealed to them. It is revealed unto us. That's why the Old Testament is called mystery. The New Testament is called revelation. So if you use the revelation to explain the mystery. You use the revelation to explain the mystery. The New Testament demystifies the Old Testament. The Old Testament is, is unveiled by the New Testament. That's why we are able ministers of the New Testament. Because the New Testament is the revelation of the mystery of the Old Testament. 
You can never explain the Old Testament if you do not have a good understanding of the New Testament. Because it is the New Testament that explains the Old Testament. The Old Testament does not explain itself. The Old Testament does not explain itself. It is the New Testament. That's why the New Testament is called the Apocalypsis. Apocalypsis means the revelation. The Old Testament is called Musterion, classified information. What, what declassifies that information is the New Testament. Is the New Testament. Glory to God. Which the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Even the angels who saw Jesus, the day Jesus was born, the angels who saw Jesus, they spoke by the Spirit of Christ. But if you sat those angels down and asked them to explain what they said, they can't explain it. The day Jesus was born, that incarnation, those angels that spoke, they spoke by the Spirit of, of Christ. The moment they finished speaking, they themselves didn't understand what was going on. It was a mystery to the Old Testament. Even those prophets never had the indwelling of the Spirit. The Spirit of Christ which we have today, the prophets of old didn't have. So Satan was very, very shielded. A shielded personality. Question, who shielded him? Was it God? No. Who shielded him? He held man in captivity. He held man in bondage. And he held man in spiritual debt. And a man that is in spiritual debt cannot understand spiritual things. Satan held man in spiritual debt because man, by sin, made himself a captive. So in the Old Testament, they just had faith in Christ. Now listen carefully. The best place to undress Satan is to start from the epistles. If you want to undress Satan, start from the epistles. Then come to the gospels before you go to the Old Testament. Come from the epistles, the gospels. By the time you arrive at the Old Testament, Satan will be standing naked. You undress him from the revelation of the mystery. The revelation of the mystery. Listen, this is the way to put it. Uh, you know, I like you to hear like this because it will make it easy for you. The Old Testament is where you have all the complicated, you know, complicated issues. The New Testament is the expo. So the Old Testament is like the exam question paper. While the New Testament is the expo to those questions. That is to say, anything the New Testament said nothing about in the Old Testament is useless to you. Anything you cannot find a commentary in the Old Testament for is not worth your time. Because the Old Testament is rightly divided in the New Testament. The New Testament unveils the Old Testament. So anything you can find in the New Testament and anything you cannot establish doctrinally and doctrine is the New Testament. Romans to Revelation. Doctrine. Actually, Romans to Jude. Because even Revelation is still like metaphorical. So core doctrine is the book of Romans. Acts of the Apostles is not a doctrinal material. It's an eyewitness account. So the only way to understand the Old Testament is by using the binoculars of the New Testament to look at the Old Testament and then suddenly Satan is undressed. Now let's do a little bit of study here. You will see that God never killed anybody if you use the New Testament to look at the Old Testament. If you use the New Testament to look at the Old Testament, you will see that God never killed anybody. Look at Luke chapter 10 verse 17. Let's see Jesus' commentary. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through your name. Next verse. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan... As, 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 as lightning fall from heaven. This statement is what you call a simile in literature. This is a simile. That is, as similar as lightning falls, that is how Satan fell. He is not saying Satan fell from the sky. He is not saying Satan was in the atmosphere up there. So Satan now fell down. No, that, you are thinking like a carnal man. 
He was using a simile. He didn't say Satan fell from heaven. Look at another place. Matthew 25, 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. This is a parable. It's not literal. This is illustrative. So we cannot draw a doctrinal construction from this statement because it is a parable. It is illustrative. All right? Gehenna. You know, the place of darkness. Look at Matthew 16, 21. Pay attention. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Next verse. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Next verse. And, but he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. For thou savourest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. So you see, first of all, that Jesus knew everything that was going to happen to him. He was not ignorant of it. He knew everything. That's why he told them. He exposed it to them. That means spiritual death is an offense unto Jesus. He said to Peter, you are an offense to me. What he meant is, Peter, your spiritual death, that state you are in that made you to be talking like this, is an offense to me. And that is the reason, you know, men will always follow Satan. Because they don't serve all the things of God. They will always follow Satan. If Peter had the Holy Ghost, the moment Jesus said, I will be betrayed, I will be killed, I will be handed over to the hands of sinners, he will have lifted his hands and shout, Glory! He will have rejoiced. Because that's why Jesus came. But a natural man, no, no, no. He said, you are an offense. You are blocking the purpose. Because he wasn't spiritual. He was dead. He was a natural man. He should have celebrated because that's all mankind has been waiting for. So you see, that means spiritual death is an offense to Jesus. Now that's a deep statement. That is the reason men will always follow Satan. Look at John 8, 39. You will love this. Then answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you will do the works of Abraham. Next verse. But now you seek to kill me. A man that had told you the truth. Which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Next verse. Woo. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him. We be not born of fornication. We have one father. Even God. Ah, they hit back at Jesus. We are not born of fornication. You know what they were telling Jesus? You, we don't know who your father is. Your mother got pregnant and just delivered you. So you came out of fornication. But we didn't come. We are father and mother. Next verse. Jesus, I, I, I love Jesus. He knows how to answer them. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you will love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. <laughs> Next verse. Why? Jesus, I love Jesus. Why do you not understand my speech? Since you are from God, why don't all of you understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Why can they not hear his word? And why can they not understand his speech? 44 now. You are of your father, the devil. You are of your father, the devil. You are of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. Oh my goodness. So God could never have created a murderer. Because if the devil was a murderer from the beginning, 
then certainly it is not God that created a murderer. So when he says from the beginning, it's a terminology used for Genesis, particularly the act of creation. When you read John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Actually, it should read, if not for grammatical limitation, it should have read, before time began was the word. Before time began was the word, because he was dealing with the pre-incarnate nature of Jesus. Before time began. Then verse 2. Verse 2 of John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God. The same was in Genesis. So verse 1, before Genesis. Verse 2, in Genesis. The same was in the beginning. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. Alright? Now, pay attention. So when Jesus said, in the beginning here, let's see another example. Matthew 19 verse 4. Because he was a murderer from the beginning. And we must establish where that beginning will be. And he answered and said unto them. Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning. Made them male and female. Next verse. And said for this cause shall a man leave father and mother. And shall cleave to his wife. And they twin shall be one flesh. Next verse. Wherefore there are no more twin but one flesh. What therefore God had joined together. Let no man put asunder. Verse 8. Quickly jump to verse 8. He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. So what will be the beginning? Remember, this, this verse of scripture Jesus made reference to was in Genesis chapter 2. When God took Eve out of Adam. So Genesis chapter 2 was called beginning, which is not part of Genesis 1 creation. So when he said that there was a murderer from the beginning, he is not talking about Genesis 1. Beginning has to do with Genesis. You know, man was created on the sixth day. Man was created last, making him a creature of God that was always sufficient because everything was finished before man came. God brought man into sufficiency. Marriage came after Eve came out of man. After Eve came out of man was when marriage came. There was no marriage when Eve was inside the man. It was after that deep sleep that Adam stood up and said, she is bone of my bones. That's where marriage came. So marriage came after Eve came out of man. So when Jesus said in the beginning, he was referring to the devil in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3. Where did he become a murderer? In Genesis chapter 4. So we see the devil in chapter 3. And we see his murderous act in chapter 4. So when he say he was a murderer from the beginning, he was making reference to Cain. How do we know that that's what he was making reference to? It's in First John, I told you again, that the New Testament is the expo for the Old Testament. First John chapter 3 verse 11. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Next verse. Not as Cain. Who was of that wicked one and slew his brother and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's works were righteous. Cain slew his brother. Why was he called a murderer? First John 3 15. Whosoever hated his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. So in the beginning... He was referring to Genesis. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve, through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. This serpent. In other words, that beginning was not the beginning when Satan was created. Because Satan was already in oppression before he influenced Cain to murder Abel. So the question is, what form was the devil created before he became a murderer? Before he became a liar? In what form was the devil? There could only have been one form. Now, there are two scriptures that are very, very theologically controversial. But there's no, no basis, no need for the controversy. Because we'll see what it is. Now, 
Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12 to 14. I like you to read it. Isaiah 14, 12 to 14 and Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. Notice in Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. Let me read quickly. How art thou falling from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which this weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like, I will be like, I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pits. Notice what he was to do to ascend unto meaning he was not there satan was not in heaven he said i will ascend meaning he was not there that's number one to ascend unto the earth begun in genesis 1 however there are a few controversies because when you look at the old hebrew translation of that chapter they had an overkill, you know, in the way they wrote it here. Because the construction of this place was referring to a person on earth. However, if we read, you know, the portion of scripture, just like we say Satan was never revealed. He was, you know, uh, classified in the Old Testament. When you read the place, you will not see Satan literally. You won't see him. Because he was veiled in all of the Old Testament. But when you come into the epistles, you will undress Satan. The epistle will expose that Isaiah where we just read. And the epistle will expose that Ezekiel where we just read. Because if you do not know in what form Satan was, and if you don't know where Satan came from, you may not be able to handle him. As long as he remains a mystery in your understanding, anybody can just tell you Satan is going to come from the back. And you will not know whether it's true or false. So that's why it's important to know in what form was Satan and how did he function? So that when you exercise authority, you can exercise your authority effectively. Now, it's very important for you to know that the devil, the devil was a murderer from the beginning. From the beginning. Take note of that. He was a murderer from the beginning. Number two, he had the power of death. So God is not the killer. The devil murdered from the beginning number two satan had the power of death number three john 10 10 the thief cometh not but for to steal to kill and to destroy to steal to kill and to destroy look at jesus i am come that you may have life and have it more abundantly also look at this luke chapter 9 the disciples say, should we command fire to come down from heaven and destroy them as Elijah did? Jesus rebuked him and said, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the son of man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another, another village. From all of this, you can tell that the devil was hiding behind the scenes and operating through circumstances and killing people. And making the people attribute his havoc to God. Because these men were spiritually dead. Hence, they didn't know who Satan was. Let me, let me tell you something. Do you know that in the Old Testament, they never knew who Satan was. It was only when Jesus showed up that he began to expose Satan. Jesus walked into a place and all the demons started shouting, Hey, have you come to destroy us before our time? We know who you are. You are the son of God. It never happened ever. It never, that's what the Bible says. The people say, this man's doctrine, this man has a new doctrine that even by his word, he cast out devils. So it was the revelation of Jesus that exposed the devil. It was the revelation of Jesus. You will never know Satan and you will never be able to handle Satan until you know who Jesus is. It is the revelation of Jesus that undresses the devil because Jesus is light and darkness is exposed when light comes in. Until you see Jesus, you'll never know who the devil is. You'll never know his limits. You'll never know how he functions until you know who Jesus is. That's why instead of finding out who the devil is, find out who Jesus is. And then from Jesus, check where the devil is. You see how little he is? You see how limited he is? 
you see what an entity is and you see why he must not occupy the space in your prayer. Do you know that some pastors, if you take Satan, demons, kill, die, bind, lose out of their prayer and you ask them to pray, they won't be able to pray. If you remove from them, kill, die, bind, lose, out. Eh? If you take those adjectives out from them and you tell them pray, they have nothing to pray. Which means predominantly, their prayer is in acknowledgement of how Satan has used their ignorance to torment them. But we're in the light. This then is a message that we have heard of him. That God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And the entrance of his word giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. Can I hear powerful amen? So in the light of revelation, Satan is exposed. And the redemptive sacrifice of Jesus rendered the devil totally disarmed. The devil is not an issue for the believer. Because the believer, the believer is in the light. The believer is walking in the light. The light of God's word. And he that walketh in the light has no occasion of stumbling. When you walk in the light, you don't entertain fear. You don't tolerate fear. You don't, you don't play with fear. And you don't engage fear. You live in faith. Where faith is, fear is not. Where fear is, faith is not. And what brings faith is the revelation of God's word concerning who you are. Can I hear a powerful amen? Stand on your feet. That's all I got for you. Glory to God. Oh, glory. Father, we pray for everybody in this building, online, in the house centers, campuses around the world, the social media community. We pray for everyone that the revelation of Jesus rises big on your inside until nothing else matters. In the name of Jesus, veils fall off and I decree that the devil is totally being unmasked and undressed completely the next few days and I declare where he had a a hold before now through ignorance that hold is terminated where he had an oppressive activity through ignorance the yoke of oppression is terminated in the name of Jesus thank you Lord that your people are rising big in revelation knowledge rising big in the light of the world rising big in the finished work of Christ exercising and functioning within the confines of our authority I pray for everybody connected to this service that the eyes of your understanding be flooded with light that you know the hope of your calling that you know the riches of your inheritance in the saints that you know the exceeding greatness of his power to us what who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in christ when he raised him from the dead revelation knowledge like never before thank you father for answered prayer we rebuke sickness we rebuke infirmity satan get your hands off of our viewer and we receive healing on your behalf now receive your healing in the name of jesus Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. I'd like to welcome you formally to the start of the second part and papa is on now with me by the way my name is michael bush i'm your anchor i've been very excited doing this global show and it excites me even more to welcome papa dr edel damina mr bush good to have you here today my goodness so nice to have you papa thank you we need to get down okay so welcome to the show i especially liked the entire setup now i do too and um so, um, Papa, I wish to remain anonymous. I'm writing from the UK. Thank you, sir, for allowing God to use you in opening our eyes to God's word. I really appreciate you, Papa. Here are my questions. Number one, you've always explained that the word scripture in the Bible refers to the Old Testament books. What's the scripture of truth that Daniel refers to in Daniel 10, verse 21, since Daniel is part of the Old Testament? Well, again, it's the same thing. It's just talking about the canon, you know, scripture. Scripture is not just a particular word for New Testament. It's also been the word used in Old Testament times. So he was making reference to the same thing. Okay, so a second question, uh, that's still from the anonymous guy in the UK. Number two, in 2004, 2005, I used to attend Power City while I was studying at the University of Ohio. I remember you always invite and introduce Papa Ayo as your spiritual father. Now that your message is kind of different from his, is he still your spiritual father? How is your relationship now with him? 
Well, we relate. We relate as believers. We relate as people that are saved by Christ. Okay. So, and finally, so I asked the both question because I'm close to some men of God who call me their spiritual son. I do not know how to tell them that I'm not since I do not agree with 60% of their teachings and doctrines. Thank you, sir. Well, if somebody keeps calling you a son, one day you have to put the record straight. One day you have to look at him in the face and tell him, excuse me, sir, with all due respect, you are not my spiritual father. But I acknowledge you as an elder in the body of Christ. But you are not my father. I have a father and I know my father. You know, I had that experience. One man of God was always calling me son. One day I said, excuse me, when I got born again, you have not, you have not been born again. Why, would, why are you calling me son? I started ministry before you. Please stop that. Don't, if it's a joke, don't try it again. That was the end. He never was called Was it because me. of his natural age? Maybe. Maybe because he, you know, he was older than me. But when I got saved and I started preaching, he was still drinking alcohol and out of the faith. Mm. I was there when he got born again. So some people just feel good calling people son. But it's your responsibility to put the record straight. Okay. Um, I don't know. I think that um, this paper, this piece of paper, Papa, is the anonymous paper. Because the two questions that come in from there are both anonymous. Okay. This one says, good morning, Papa. Or good afternoon, Papa. I would like to remain anonymous. Thank you for being a great teacher and a father to my family. Please, I write this message, this message with pain and regrets in my heart. As a single mother of five, my first son has been giving me trouble since he was little and now he's 28. I've always been praying for him, but every time he gets worse with his activities of stealing from people outside and even his younger ones. I've tried as a mother to get in good jobs, but after one or two months on the job, he will run away with people's money and come back home like a prodigal son. But I always forgive him as a mother. Today, before we woke up in the house, he ran away with my car. He ran away in my car. Because you say with my car, it will seem as if he carried the car in his, head, <laughs> in his pocket. He ran away in, in my car and even locked up, uh, us up in the house and ran away with the house key. But thank God my neighbor was able to help him opening the door. Papa, please, I need you and my fellow sons to pray for him to walk in that consciousness of what Christ has done for him and also pray that he returns my car. What's the name? No, no name. name. I don't well, know why he should, he should have given name. us the name sure. so we can speak to him directly. But whatever the case is, in the name of Jesus, we stand in faith with you and we ask that the glorious light of Christ will reach your son, that circumstances be arranged to arrest him and bring him back home. And in the name of Jesus, we demand that you will not be able to take that car beyond where he is now. He returns the keys to you and we decree that by the power of the Holy Spirit, every hold of darkness over him is broken and the light of Christ reaches him in Jesus' name. Papa, let's go to South Africa next. I have this one from Gusinate Mambuso, who's writing from South Africa, and says, I greet to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for what you're doing in the body of Christ. Uh, and he says, Kabota, Kabota, Daddy. What does that mean? Well, I don't know what it means, but maybe you have the interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, question, who created Satan? Why was Jesus tempted after the 40 days and uh, nights of fasting? Who did Moses want to see in Exodus 33, 18? Show me the, thy glory. And what uh, was that back part that Moses uh, saw? What, what, you know, I think he's asking the, the back yeah, the of back, what did yeah. Moses see? Yes. And then my yeah. last question is, who was Moses talking to face to face in Exodus 33, 11? Okay, now the questions are running. Let me so, start one by one. So who created Satan? Well, Satan is not created by God. Satan was a creation of transgression and rebellion of Adam. So the fall of Adam was the rise of Satan. So you could say in some sense it was man that created Satan? Yes, in some sense we can say it's man. Okay, so why was Jesus tempted after the 40 days and nights of fasting? Well, again, that temptation, like I've always said, both Matthew and Luke account was a summary of all the temptations. It was not one temptation. It was a summary. Theologians call it the pride of life, the loss of the flesh, and the loss of the eyes, which represents all the areas in which Jesus was tempted. But the narrator wrote it like one event, but it's actually a summary. Okay, Papa, let's move around. It says, why did Moses want to see, or who did Moses want to see in Exodus 33, 18? Moses, Show me thy glory. he wanted to see the incarnation. He wanted to see the visible appearance of Christ. And God told him, no, it is not time. It's not a, the time for you to see that. So you will not see that. Because when you see that, you will live forever. You will live. There's a way it's written. It looks like when you see, you will not live. But actually, it's that when you see, you will live. But the time is not now. But you will see the back part, which is types and shadows. Okay, so that, um, Mr. Inter, that was just like, um, another question. So my last question is, who was Moses talking to face to face in Exodus 33, 11? In Exodus 33, 11, Moses was actually talking with God in a medium, not face to face. Nobody saw the face of God until the incarnation. 
Okay, Papa, let's move around. I was still going to go to some other country, some other parts of South Africa, but let's go to Lesotho, Lesotho, Karabo, Nkanya, right from Lesotho. Since my family and I are grateful for the work you're doing in the body of Christ. Indeed, Satan shall never molest the saints anymore due to the work you're doing. Saints are becoming more enlightened by your teachings. Once again, thank you. My question is on First Peter chapter 3, verse 19. Please, Papa, clarify for us this verse. The verse gives an impression that Christ within three days went to preach to the spirits which were in prison. However, you have several times mentioned that preaching was done in times of Noah. Please, Papa, give more clarity. Thank you. Yeah, because Christ didn't preach to anybody. If Christ will preach to anybody, it will not be, it will not be in death. Because if Christ did that when he died, then it means... There will still be preaching going on for people that die because God does not do select, selective partiality or is not partial. So Christ didn't preach. He didn't go to hell to preach. He went to hell to pay for sin and rose from the dead. So it was a mode of writing that made it look like that. Actually, it was the spirit of Christ in Noah, the spirit of Christ in Noah that preached to the people of his day. And when they didn't receive the gospel, when Christ died and went to hell, those people were in hell because they rejected the gospel. Okay, Papa, from Lesotho to Zambia, and um, sir, my name is Nancy from Lusaka, Zambia. I have the question which I want to know. Is it okay to ask anything in prayer to God? As Matthew 7, 7 says, I really want to understand this part of scripture. And thank you so much. My life has changed from this time I started following your sermons and teachings. Thank you, sir. Well, you can ask God anything as it is within the confines of his character. Not just anything, but the things that are within the confines of God's character in Christ, Char God's character. You can't ask for what is not in his character. It has to be within his character. And to know his character, you must know Christ. When you know Christ, you know exactly the things to receive and to ask by faith. Papa, still from Zambia, um, writes um, Trison Mbappe. He says, if only everyone on earth could teach the word of God to that level of truth, Christianity would be everywhere on earth soon. My desire is to come to Nigeria next year, be equipped and buy all the types of books you have. You said Adam rejected the truth, which is the gospel. Then what was sin, which Adam accepted? Please explain that to me. Well, the rejection of the gospel is the sin. Because when you reject the gospel, you reject Christ. When you reject Christ, you reject life. The absence of life is death, is sin, is darkness. Still from John Wamza in Chizamba district of uh, Zambia. Question number two. What would you say about the person who sent, who sent prophet God with a message of plague to David in 2 Samuel 24, 12 to 15 after David had counted Israel's army? Well, again, remember it was Satan. It wasn't God. It was Satan. Because if you read very well and read Chronicles, you'll find out that it was Satan. In um, Philippians 2, 9 to 11, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Whose knee and tongue to bow and confess? Believers only or everybody's? Uh, and when will this be? It's a figure of speech. It just simply means that by virtue of what Jesus has done, anyone who believes the gospel and anyone who hears the gospel will bow to the, to the redemptive sacrifice of Christ. And demons and devils will also bow. So it's a figure of speech. It's not tongue literally, and it's not knee literally. His question number four, can speaking in tongues be taught? No, it cannot be taught, but believers can be taught. Believers can be taught how to receive what the Holy Ghost, what God has given to them in the spirit. They can be taught their rights, and then they can receive by themselves. Okay, the last question from John Wamza in Chisamba district of Zambia is, what would you say was the purpose of Samson's power if not to kill Israel's enemies in defending them. God bless you, Papa and Mr. Bush. Well, again, remember, physical countries develop their army, they develop their defense, so that when there is war, they can protect their country. That doesn't mean it is God. It just simply means that every country and every nation has a responsibility to protect its territorial integrity. So okay. it's within the activities of men. Two more takes from Zambia, and then we move on to other parts of the continent. Greetings, Mr. Bush and Dr. Damina. This is Kennedy Luo from Zambia. My question is, if the law was given to man, Moses, as a mediator by angels, as ordained, then who gave the angels the permit to proceed with action they took? Wasn't it God? No, it was Moses. Remember, angels were created to serve man. And since Moses was in charge, then he engaged the angels to work with him in carrying out the laws. 
Papa and Mr. Bush, you're doing a good job for the body of Christ globally. Yes, Papa, I'm looking forward to getting more material. But just comment on 666. This comes from Leonard Besa from P2S Zambia. 666 was a figurative communication on a doctrine that denies the humanity or the deity of Christ. Okay. Um, and, and something anonymous, I don't know why people send anonymous entries, but Papa, thank you so much for all that you are laboring. May God continue to open the eyes of your understanding of his word for the perfection of the saints. Papa, I want you to help us on the challenge to see today's Christians. A believer in politics, Papa, I think you talked about this yesterday. It's just been repeated. Can you just talk about what you, the expectations as a believer when you're in politics? As a believer in politics, you play politics according to the rules of politics. A believer in business, you do business according to the rules of business. Okay. And another anonymous entry says, um, to our lovely father, you are a great blessing to our generation. Please, Papa, explain Matthew 8, 21 to 22 and Luke 9, 59 to 60. Bless you. It simply means that the family that have the dead body are responsible for the burial of their dead person. That's all it means. Okay. And uh, the second one is Luke 9, 59 to 60. And he said unto him, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Next verse. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead, but go down and preach the kingdom of God. Same thing. He was saying that you must never allow the burial of the dead, you know, replace the preaching of the gospel. Because, you know, there are some cultures where people worship dead bodies. They literally worship the dead. When somebody dies, they stop everything and just worship that dead body. So Jesus taught against it. We don't worship the dead. When people die, we honor them, we bury them, but we don't let the dead body or the burial get in the way of the living. Okay, from Zambia, quickly, quickly, let's go to Uganda in East Africa. Alban Songo from Kampala, Uganda. Greetings, our dear daddy. We love you and follow your teaching so, so much. We have been blessed a great deal. Glory in Papa's voice. Mm -hmm. I used to have many questions when I started listening to you. I ever somehow, somehow, I always find the answers while listening to you teach. This time I'm asking on behalf of our group, Papa, which language shall we use in heaven? Is it tongues, seeing that when we speak in them, we utter mysteries by the Spirit? Also, Jesus' body was visible in our physical realm. And yet now also is living with it in the immaterial realm in heaven. Kindly support us with better understanding of how it all works. Well, first of all, when we, when we drop mortality, tongues will no more be like tongues. That we will now, it will now be our natural language because there will no more be limitation in understanding. Secondly, Jesus in the, is in the immaterial. But the immaterial is such that the immaterial is such that when Jesus rose from the dead, his material body was visible on earth and at the same time immaterial. That is why he could walk through walls. That's why he could enter a room without window and door because of the lack of limitation of that body. That body has no limitation at all. It can function both immaterially and materially, but it is an immaterial body. Okay, from Uganda, let's fly to the Republic of Cameroon, Limbe specifically. By the way, Cameroon is in Central Africa. It's on the crossroads between West and Central Africa. So, greetings to you, Papa Damina, the Apostle Paul in miniature. I'm Aki N. Samuel from Limbe, Cameroon. Please, Papa, what was Jesus implying when he made this statement in Matthew chapter 15, verse 24? Does it mean he came only for the lordship of the house of Israel? What about those of us who weren't part of the commonwealth of Israel? Did he not come for us also? All right, so when Jesus said he was sent to the lordship of the house of Israel, what he was simply saying is he brought the gospel. He came himself to the Jewish people, and the Jewish people did not receive him. All right, so that's what he simply meant. Because God's plan was to use Israel as a pattern for the whole world. But Israel did not receive him, so that purpose ended there. Then he now opened the gospel to whosoever because he will have used Israel as a pattern to attract the nations of the world. But Israel did not accept it. That's what it simply means. Okay, coming closer home, in Ghana. Papa, thank you for the great work. My name is Apostle Isaac Ndwawa from Ghana. Please, Papa, I need more explanation on Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. It talks about anointing oil. Okay, Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from, uh, from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. He's just talking about part of the prayer, the Lord's prayer. 
Okay. He wasn't talking about oil there. He's talking about the Lord's Prayer. Yes, we also want some understanding on um, anointing oil. Okay. There's a way that scripture ought to be written in the original. It is, you lead us not into temptation, but you deliver us from evil. That's, what, that's the way it reads. And that changes the whole meaning. For thine is the kingdom, the power. You lead us not. God does not lead us into temptation. God delivers us from evil. Alright, so that's the way it should read. And it was like acknowledging or appreciating what God does to us. That's the way the prayer was written. Now, anointing oil. I don't know why people are having issues with anointing oil. First of all, olive oil has manufacturer date, has expiry date. It cannot have eternal purpose. In the Old Testament, it was symbolic. It was symbolic of the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, it is not used at all, except James. And who did James write to? He wrote to the Jews. What was the tellers of the book of James? To the Jewish audience, if any is sick among you, let him call for elders. Let them anoint him with oil for the sick, for the sick. And the prayer of faith shall heal. The healing is by the prayer, not the oil. Which means the oil was just cultural. In the New Testament, the anointing is a person. His name is Jesus. He lives on the inside of the believer. First John chapter 2 verse 20. First John chapter 2 verse 27. You have an unction from the Holy One. You know all things. Then 27 he explains in the post text. But the anointing which you have received abides in you. You already carry the anointing in the person of the Holy Ghost. You don't need a bottle of oil. Finally, we are in Lagos, Nigeria. Papa, my name is Victor. I'm in Lagos. I want to say a very big thank you for your labor in bringing light to our understanding and also well done to Mr. Bush for the good job. Please, Papa, my questions. Is it wrong, number one, for a believer to own a bar, a pub, a nightclub? All right, now, it depends on what your definition of the bar, the pub, and the nightclub is. Because, again, you can have a nightclub where people come and just, where couples come and chill out at night. It depends on what your definition is. All right, so that your definition will determine what answer I give to you. However, is it right for a believer to own a bar where people come to drink, get drunk, naked themselves, and abuse themselves, or appear funny? You are a believer. What is not good for you is not good for your neighbor. You are a believer. What is not good for you is not good for your neighbor. You love people the way Christ has loved you. Christ will not give you what you will take and become a fool of yourself. So don't give it to other people. That's just my answer to that question. Okay, you there. Hello. Yes, sir. I'm Emmanuel from a quiet state. Okay. Right. Yes, I want to ask if it is good for a man to play football and play best Nigeria. Play it is not legitimate coupon. way of making money. Okay, coupon and bet Niger. Well, you see, it's like saying, is it good for a man to wear white shirt or blue shirt to come to church? That's what you're asking me. It doesn't affect anything spiritual and it doesn't affect anything moral. You're not stealing. You're just trying your luck. However, as a believer, you shouldn't live by playing bet Niger because those are not reliable ways of making money. If you want to play that as a hobby, all right. But you should also be ready for the consequences that come along with it. That's just my answer. Uh, Papa, it's not my business to say so, but I think that's a very fantastic answer. Thank you. That, Mr. That's very unpretentious and that's real. You know, Papa, as I said yesterday, I think Christians... More and more Christians should listen to you. You know, they should watch you. They should, I mean, because it looks like we all live a lie. Mm. We want to do uh, different things. Lights are off. We yeah. want to do another thing yeah. when the lights are on. But you are just saying, be you, be yourself. Yeah. Another caller. Hello. Are you there? Hello. Yes, thank yes. you for joining Hello. us. Your name, where are you calling from? Yes, go ahead. Well, so this is a more from the room. Okay. I want to appreciate the friend of the for the death. And uh, in life, he has brought to the body of Christ in the spirit. Please, I want to understand the scripture that from Psalm is due to back up water baptism, where Jesus told John that suffer is to be so to fulfill all righteousness. So, what was that? Because that is actually what from church is due to God says they are baptism after somebody is born. Okay. Okay, remember the water baptism. 
was actually John's way of identifying Jesus. That is why Jesus said, suffer it so to be that all righteousness be fulfilled. But I think, Mr. Bush, I should take a few minutes and really nail this baptism thing so we can be free from those questions. John chapter 1 verse 29. We're going to read a few verses. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Next verse. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man, which is preferred before me, for he was before me. Next verse. John is talking now. And I knew him not. John is saying, I didn't know him. But that he should be made manifest to Israel. So that Israel can know him. Therefore, am I come baptizing with water. So the purpose for the water baptism was for John to identify Jesus. That's the whole purpose. For John to identify Jesus. And when Jesus showed up, John was trying to stop Jesus. Jesus said, no. Suffer it so to be that all righteousness be fulfilled. Meaning, let me be baptized so that you too can have evidence that I am the one. Because it is in the baptism that the spirit will descend like a dove. And it is in that baptism that you will hear the voice. So let's go all the way. So Jesus was baptized and Jesus came out of the water. And John for sure knew that this is Jesus. But remember, John now said to them, I, John, I baptize you with water. But the mightier than I is coming. His shoes I'm not worthy to lose. He will not use water. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. John is gone. His ministry has finished. Which means water has gone. It is now Jesus' ministry. Jesus does not use water. Jesus uses the Holy Ghost. So the fulfillment of the righteousness now was for John to experience that encounter that confirms to John that this is Jesus so that he can show him to Israel boldly and confidently. That's what it meant. Okay, let's just go back to River State and round off. Yeah. Another caller, just in time. Hello. Are you there? Morning, uh, this is Martin calling. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Go ahead, please. Uh, I'm calling from Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. Thank you, Pastor Hebel. Thank you, Mr. Bishu. I just wanted to get clarity on the book of First uh, Corinthians chapter three, from verse one and two, where Paul was saying that um, I I was feeding you guys with milk, but yet you are not able to be it. Okay. All right. Thank you for calling. Okay. And as a matter of fact, that call from Atlanta is the last that we'll take today. We have just six minutes to round off this edition of the program. Uh, so when Brother Paul was saying he was feeding them with milk, remember, uh, Peter says, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk. He was talking about, I've been teaching you the fundamentals, but you're not even able to bear the fundamentals. Because remember, in that Corinthians, he said to them, I couldn't speak to you as unto spiritual." but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, but you can't even handle the basics that I'm feeding you. Because among you, you are still exhibiting symptoms of carnality. That is, you are not even understanding basic things in Christianity. Otherwise, there will be no division. But when all of you are beginning to fight among yourselves, some say I'm for Apollos, some say I'm for Paul and all that. He say you are carnal, you have not even understood that in the kingdom is not about divisions and competition. So what Paul was dealing with there as milk is the fundamentals. You know, fundamentals. You are born of God, walk in love. All of those fundamentals, they couldn't handle it. So based on that, brother Paul now began to deal with issues in Corinth using, using uh, parables. Parables. Because they couldn't handle spiritual communication. So that is why in the book of Corinthians, the entire chapter, the entire book, he kept dealing with issues, beginning with the brother who took his father's wife. You know, he dealt with that case. And then he dealt with other issues like the covering of head and all that. And then he came to communion. The rebranded Passover, which we call the communion. All of those were brother Paul's way of using parables to explain spiritual realities to the people in Corinth since they couldn't handle spiritual communication. Papa, just um, three minutes to sign off, and then um, I have three questions. I'll try and see how we squeeze them in. Pastor I.J. Kwere, my producer, was a special 
capacity to just hear everything. Even the ones that you and I do hear, Papa. I said that that question from that lady in Abuja was actually the difference between Satan and Lucifer. Okay, Lucifer is not Satan. Lucifer is actually, like I said, it means son of the morning. It's actually a name actually used for Jesus. But we don't want to say that because we don't have much in the scripture to back it up. So Satan means the evil one. That is more appropriate for Satan. And like I said, Satan has never been called Lucifer. It's just the way the narration was in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we see that Jesus is the morning star. And that's the meaning of the word Lucifer. But we don't want people to take this out of context. So that's why we, don't, we are not too loud on it because the scriptures are not too loud on it. We just leave it there. Today, having seen the truth by revelation through you, I'm being tagged preaching hearsay. How would uh, my general overseer not disown me since he is a combination of law and grace? Currently, with all my humility of sharing this truth with colleagues, they vehemently stand against me. What do you say to somebody like that? Uh, you say, preaching hearsay. Yeah, since you have already come out and they now know what you preach, you have to prayerfully begin to look for how to, you know, withdraw and eventually look for a church where the truth is preached. And if there's none in your area, you may need to send us a mail so that we can be able to work with you and help you start a campus where other people who are seeking for the truth of the gospel can come with you and study the word. Uh, it goes on, number, question number six, I think there is deliverance. The madman of Gadarin was uh, delivered by Jesus. I feel you we could be preaching or uh, teaching and as usual with the power of the Holy Spirit and the demon-possessed person scream, possibly tortured by the demons to make its host rolling on the floor just as one was piercing himself before Jesus. Just what you did now is in Jesus. You have corrupted the Bible. You have twisted the Bible to say what you think. Because the word deliverance is the word aphesis. Aphesis means moving from darkness to light. There's a difference between deliverance and casting out devils. What you describe as deliverance is casting out devils. Jesus casted out devils from the madman of Gadara. But that's why Jesus will now say, when an unclean spirit goes out, it goes through dry places. And if it doesn't find a place, it will come back to its own house where it left. And if the person is not born again, the unclean spirit will go and bring more demons and occupy. That is casting out devils. Born again simply means you move from darkness to light. No evil spirit can come back because movement means Christ has entered and occupied. That's why deliverance is born again. Aphesis. But casting out demons means to expel demons. And you can expel demons and they can come back. If the person is not born again, they can enter him and make his case worse. That's the difference. However, I will recommend for you my book on the complete Bible deliverance. It will clear all of these concepts for you. I'm quite proud, Papa, of your work. Thank you. And this, uh, I'm quite also appreciative, I need to say it, of this global stage. Yeah, a blessing, man. Thank a you, Papa. full blessing, and everybody is celebrating you all over the world. Man. Papa. You have gained more popularity Papa, than they're, me. Papa, they are celebrating <laughs> you more. They are celebrating you more. Oh, yeah. the applause there, Papa. Is it yeah. for you or for me? It's for two of us. <laughs> We need to go. We need to go. Yeah, we're going. Hey, 30 guys. days of glory, people. This is day 22. We'd like to thank everyone in the studios. Pastor IG Equere leading the team. Pastor Kufred Johnson. Thank you. Dr. Martin Sakban. Hey. It's also a pastor. Yeah. And my boss. Yeah. Dr. Idoreyan Udol. Pastor. Thank you. Studio cameraman of Oni Mil Moren. Sound uh, engineer. Edi Khan. Studio hands. Everyone. Joins me, Michael Bush, in New Nigeria, to say, Papa, take yeah. us home. We love you guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. And we'll be buy blessed. from you, Amen. Nigeria. Glory! Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. I know you have been blessed. It's been an exciting time of teaching, answering questions, and bringing clarity to you where the word of God and the doctrine of Christ is concerned. And I'm excited that you are also going to help me spread the news, get more people to hook up to this 60 days of glory extended so they can be built up, edified, and they can grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. If you're following and you don't belong to any local church where Christ is revealed, you want to be a part of a local family. 
The word of God says, God says the solitary in families. God wants you to be in a local church where you are accountable, where you are being taught, and where you also are able to serve the body of Christ with your giftings and callings and be a blessing to the body. And if there's no such a body in your area or community or in your nation, all you need to do today is shoot a mail to me, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. And we will try to make sure that we connect you with brethren in your area who are part of our church campus in that location so you can get the word of God, be fed the word of God, and grow in the knowledge of Christ. Let me also mention those of you who would like to get copies of my new books. They are books you don't want to miss having. One of them is The Last Days. is a book on eschatology that deals with all the myths on 666, Antichrist, you know, great tribulation and all that around the last days. The son of perdition, false prophets, false teachers is a whole eschatology material with sound exegesis. The last days. All right. There's another one I released on the office of the pastor. It's a material that equips you to become an effective tool in the hand of Christ for building disciples and building believers in the knowledge of Christ and effectively serving as a pastor over a local church. You know, once you start overseeing two, three, four, five people, that's already a church where two or three are gathered. That's what makes a church. So once you're already growing to where you're beginning to disciple people, you need to read this book on the office of the pastor so you can serve the people of God no matter how many they are effectively. That book is a good book. The third one I release is the Bible truth about material world. There's usually a clash between material world and the gospel. So this is sound exegesis on what Christ taught, the apostles taught, the New Testament theology where material wealth is concerned and how to use material wealth, you know, in serving Christ and honoring Christ. Then there's the material I also released is a free material. And that book is on eternal salvation in Christ. It deals with all the scriptures that throw doubts on salvation being eternal or salvation being forever. All those scriptures in the Bible, including the famous Hebrews chapter 6 verse 4, sound exegesis. But the exciting thing is that this particular book is free. We're giving it free, both in hard copy from our office and online. We have an online edition. I want to pray for you. I decree and I declare that you are bound in knowledge. You are bound in grace. The eyes of your understanding being flooded with light. That you grow and grow into the fullness of God. And above all, that the revelation of Jesus grows big on your inside until nothing else matters. In the name of Jesus. We rebuke sickness and disease. We command sick bodies be healed. In Jesus name. Amen. Praise God. You don't want to miss the next broadcast coming up at 10 p.m. GMT plus one as we continue with the 60 days of glory extended questions, answers, and the teaching of God's word. We love you guys. Enjoy the rest of your day and be blessed. Amen. Amen to your